So too, you're skeptical about Ethereum, even though that goes up quite a bit and there seems to be no problem with performance. But on the other hand, the Bitcoin network, the block is full. The block is full. Transaction fees are crazy. You have to wait 2100 minutes for a transaction until you pay. And the governance seems to be in real problem, you know, big, uh, big, big, big arguments. How will the, the, the Bitcoin uh, network solve it, you think? Right. Well, first of all, Bitcoin is a lot more mature than, than Ethereum is. Like it's, it's been around for eight years. And so we're, if you look at like global volumes, like over, uh, over a billion dollars a day is traded in Bitcoin. With Ethereum, I think you're talking about 200 million for the moment. Um, and so obviously there's a lot more demand um, and the, the, the block size is, is indeed one megabyte. Uh, that means about 300,000 transactions a day, um, and it's a matter of supply and demand. Demand is, is uh, so high at the moment that transactions cost about $1 to $2 uh, a piece. When people say that you have to wait hours and hours for transactions to get confirmed, I, I disagree with that. If you pay the appropriate fee, it gets confirmed just like minutes. it did before. 15 minutes. Um, and so, I'm saying and so if one you don't pay a fee, it's 2,100 minutes average. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of saying, like, you know, if, if I want to take the train from Amsterdam to London and I don't, don't pay the fee, it takes me years to get there. It's like, well, yeah, like, <laughs> okay. and, and of course, in Bitcoin, there's a lot of other ways to, to you know, you can, uh, there's a lot of Bitcoin exchanges that happen off chain, uh, millions a day, actually, on the exchanges, on gambling websites and all kinds of places. But the question is, how are we going to scale and still have that second layer or have, you know, the extra capacity be decentralized. That's the big, uh, the big challenge. And um, there, there's technology developed for that. There's the Lightning Network. Um, side chains are possible there too. And so now it's a question of how do we get the technology to a place where all that stuff works. And um, one of the important um, elements is... Um, Segregated Witness is a technology developed by a uh, fellow Belgian, actually, Peter Reule, uh, and a few other core devs. Um, <clears throat> and so um, uh, what has become clear is that miners are unwilling to upgrade the uh, protocol with that. And I think that the reason is probably that they suspect that they will have less uh, of an influence, less maybe earn less money down the road. Uh, most transactions move to another layer, right? If they go to Lightning, that doesn't necessarily benefit them directly. So they prefer bigger, like basically their money, they're like tall, they're like the, the, the highway maintenance people, right? And they make their money off the highway. So they prefer the three lanes to be expanded to six and 12 rather than people start taking airplanes and trains to, to get to where they need to go with Bitcoin. Um, I, I think it's a matter of time. I mean, uh, the users have a lot of power. I think they're discovering that now with the user-activated software options. Um, the one one of them is now, you know, it's, it's going to be activated on August 1st. So it's possible that this summer we'll see fireworks. It could be, it's basically a, a revolt. We could see a chain split. Um, we could see the miners fall in line just before August 1st to prevent a chain split. Um, but I think scaling is happening. Like even... Even lightning is possible without SegWit, right? So if the if the the protocol is just um, um, just uh, stays fixed and doesn't change at all, people can work their way around it. It's just going to take a bit longer. So I, I'm not worried about Bitcoin scaling. Okay, you have full trust. Okay, so in August first, we will know if uh, if the the fork is happening and if the miners fall in. Uh into place. I mean, I think the for month, them, they're, the getting now, August, yeah. they're getting now hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, a, a day in, in fees. So I, 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 they also profit from the from the limitations at the moment. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and that's a that's a pain. Okay, then uh, what do you think about all these initial coin offerings uh, which are happening now, mostly on Ethereum, but also some other uh, things? <clears throat> yeah, like there's. Several angles um, as far as that goes. Um, I think short term, like a lot of the ideas are half baked. I'm really reminded of the, some of the stuff I read about the dot com uh, era, where you know it was just the buzzwords, the dot com word that would 
allow you to raise the money rather than, you know, is, is what you're doing. Like, for example, do you actually need a blockchain, right, to do what you do? Um, and, uh, and back then it was, it was also like, do you actually need to do this through e-commerce, something that, a channel that's so immature? Are you going to sell pet food? In, in 2001, but I mean, if you, look, if you look, for example, like an idea like Brave, you know, which took 24 seconds to get 35 million by the, the guy who yeah, came yeah. up with Firefox and JavaScript and who wants to reinvent advertising. Do you also think that's a half baked mm -hmm. idea and, and sort of an. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm sure there's, you know, there's projects that have merit. My interest in in this space is mainly because uh, um, because cryptocurrency allows for the creation of liquid censorship resistant store of value, and so uh, rather than investing in the businesses that kind of spawn off this technology, my focus has been to to really focus on that. Um, and so, in the case of Brave, like I, I don't know, like. I, um, it might be promising, it might be not. I'm still worried if it's a token that's built on top of the Ethereum platform because I have scaling, um, you know, concerns, right? And so if if the price of Ethereum uh, goes up or stays the same even, uh, and the usage goes up, then the question is like, can they can they pull off, you know, scaling the thing? Because right now every smart contract is executed simultaneously on every sure. computer that runs an Ethereum node. Yeah. So so. And that just brings a lot of challenges and, and sharding or proof of stake is what they're proposing. Uh, but I still want to see it in action. Okay. Uh, and, and then there's also uh, so there's some legal concerns as well with these ICOs. I think if you launch an ICO and you say that it's a security, you're probably safe. Uh, but if you try and argue that, no, it's actually the, a utility, you might down the road get into some legal trouble. That's true. That's totally unknown territory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then about your job, I mean, at the moment in Texas, you're helping hedge funds to, to get involved in the crypto, uh, and especially Bitcoin or all kinds of cryptocurrencies? Um, I mean, yeah, the, the problem is sort of similar, like, you know, storing Bitcoin or storing other types of uh, crypto assets. It's a bit of a similar legal challenge. There are similar companies involved. Um, and so, yeah, it's not just Bitcoin uh, that, that I'm looking at. And, and also when I hear, uh, you know, interested parties, they're not just interested in Bitcoin. They just see that something's happening and they want the optionality to, to you know, give themselves exposure. Yeah. And, and that's also, they are, they have big amount of money, right? I mean, if they, I mean, now at the moment there's a billion dollars a day uh, with Bitcoin being transacted and the value is about 46 if this kind, of, if these kinds of funds are able to get into Bitcoin, the amount of money which will flow in will be tremendous. How far will, how long will that take, from your perspective? Yeah, I think right now, um, you know, based on some estimates that I'm hearing, about five percent of hedge fund managers own some cryptocurrency personally, and about 0.5 percent of the hedge funds actually are exposed with the fund which I think is tiny. And so I think it's too early to say, like, you know, this is tulip mania or whatever. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to crash first and then get the hedge fund involved and then, uh, you know, have an actual crypto, uh, um, mania happen. But um, I think right now it's possible that you can say that things are a bit overvalued or bubbly. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, I think the public that is getting involved is, is pretty, there's a lot of weak hands there. There's a lot of ignorance. Um, so we could see a big correction, but as far as how long it would take for, for hedge funds to get really involved, I think in the next decade, we will see that it's kind of like, you know, where these are the first signs of life with maybe like gold in, in 2004 and then the actual, you know, gold kind of bubble, although in a way we're still in that bull market, uh, came in 2011. So I think, I think it takes time for, for large hedge funds to, to really get not just a little bit, but get you know serious exposure. Okay. Uh, but I mean, multi multi billion dollar hedge funds are. I, I just hear about it on a, on a weekly basis, like new parties, family offices that are are seriously looking into cryptocurrencies. Okay. Um, any more? Uh, August first will be a very interesting. Uh, will be a very interesting moment. <laughs> uh, can you um, describe a little bit what will happen? I mean, it was. It's basically. And a user-driven, a user-driven split. And uh, how 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 does that work? 
Yeah, first of all, it's not a given that the network will split if 95% um, uh, of the miners accept or activate, um, sorry, signal SegWit, it will be activated before August 1st, and then nothing will happen. Uh, if um, that does not happen, and uh, less than half of the hash rate supports the user-activated software, BIP 148, then we will have a change split. And so uh, people who have coins on the legacy chain and who interact are at risk of losing their Bitcoins. Because if at some point the soft fork chain, the 148 chain, does get over the threshold of, um, of uh, um, 50% hash rate, then the entire chain gets reorganized and we, we go back from two chains to one chain. Uh, that's different than what happened with Ethereum. The split there was permanent, even though there were some replay attacks possible. Uh, but this split is uh, potentially temporary, and that's part of why it's uh, it's risky to sit on the sideline, trust your coins to maybe like a more obscure exchange that's not very up to date. I think then you really risk losing coins. So either you have your coins in in um, in a hardware wallet in your own, where the keys are in your control that if there is a split you can later figure out what to do or you you give them to an exchange that you you know hopefully was going to figure this out i have heard that uh, the larger exchanges are preparing uh, for a potential split so i do think that things will be safe but if you're if you're a bit paranoid by all means like put it on your trezor or your ledger and just wait out the summer and see what happens Okay, it will be very exciting, and we'll see how it uh, goes on. Tuur, very nice to talk to you. Look, great to see that you're in Texas. Congratulations with your first marriage, which just happened. <laughs> uh, you look very, uh, you look very satisfied, and uh, it's nice that you helped the <laughs> traditional financial industry to become more crypto aware. And it's nice to see your optimism and your uh, and your involvement in the Bitcoin uh, world. We'll uh, see you. My pleasure, Vincent. Hopefully, we'll see you uh, in Amsterdam uh, one day. And then uh, I'll be back for sure. You'll be back. Okay. This is our Belgium, uh, our Belgian trend watcher in Texas, to the Meester. Have a nice weekend. You too. Okay. So that was good.